So good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening, depending on wherever in the world you are. We're really looking forward to running this webinar for you today, how data can advance marketing maturity. Um, just a couple of quick introductions before we jump into the contents of this one hour session. So I'll introduce myself first up. My name's Rob Ferner. So I'm a digital consultant, exec education specialist and author. Um, I run a business called Burn the Sky. We help organizations with their digital transformation challenges. Uh, a lot of our focus is around banks, telcos, utilities, uh, autos, and most of it outside of the UK, thanks to Brexit and various other things. Although, of course, these days I'm, I'm sat at home in the UK doing this. Um, I'm the director with the London Institute of Banking and Finance and work as a director also with a digital product company based in Japan. Um, I work extensively with Avado, uh, with Google and the Squared Online team, and with a number of business schools where I do course leadership roles across digital disruption, digital marketing. Um, and I've written three books around digital, my main focus here uh, on mobile, happy to share any of the content uh, at the end of this session. And I'm very happy to be joined as a co-facilitator by my friend, Sam. Over to you, Sam. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you turning people on today. Uh, I'm, I'm Sam Carter, the Chief Executive of FOSFA. So just a, a word on FOSFA. We're a software business that helps direct-to-consumer uh, clients uh, independently measure their multi-channel marketing activity so that they can really get to grips with and optimize the cost of customer acquisition and drive sustainable long-term growth. A uh, tiny bit of background on me, my, my background was most directly uh, before uh, Phosphor in e-commerce, where I was part of the early team in Groupon uh, in EMEA, launching new regions, of a variety of growth roles. And that's where I really got, I first got the bug for um, attribution and uh, marketing measurement. We'll be talking a bit about that later. I look forward to uh, sharing it with you. Thanks, awesome. Rob. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sam. So the way this is going to work, I'm going to spend 15 minutes or so with an introductory prez. And then we're going to hand over to Sam, who's going to be talking, as, as you just said, in more detail around uh, attribution. And then we're going to throw this open uh, for a QA, and a and we're aiming to be done uh, within the hour. So let me kick off then. The big challenge with big data, of course, data is all around us. And in theory, this should empower businesses with more information and more insight. Uh, they should be able to make better decisions. Indeed, although marketers have plenty of data, many of them really struggle to mine it to surface the most important customer segments and respond to customers' needs in real time. And we've got uh, three questions here. We're going to do just a quick poll and get your sense on whether you feel um, that this statement is true for you and for your business. So the first question is this. What percentage of data within organizations remains untapped? What percentage of data are organizations sitting on that they're not doing anything with? So I'm just looking at the, the figures here, uh, ranging from we've got 70 percent, we've got 95 percent, we've got Sally saying uh, something crazy like 98 percent, uh, we've got 33 percent from Sir High, we've got Andrew with 70. Uh, we've got 60% um, from 80% from Mad, 60% from Marla. Okay, so this is a this is a big number, north of 50% for almost everyone, and that crazy figure um, that uh, was was suspected by Sally earlier is is pretty much right. It's 95%. So 95% of data organisations are picking up, but not doing anything with. So. This is a massive opportunity. Here's question number two. What percentage of marketers say they can't turn data into actual insights? They're gathering all this data, but they're not turning it into actionable insights to improve the performance of their business. What percentage do you think on this question? So we're getting a, a 28%. Uh, some more big, big numbers here, 70, uh, 80%, 85% from Matt, 40% from um, Forzia, Juliana, 50, uh, 
who else? Jay giving us 60, Natasha 55, Kelly up at 80. Okay, these are big numbers. The number here, and this is data from Cisco, the number here, 39%. So not quite as uh, terrible as some of the figures you've given us here, but nonetheless, a very significant number of marketers who uh, aren't doing uh, as good a job as they could do for various reasons. And we're gonna be examining this a little bit further. Then how about this question? What percentage of marketers use data to deliver a fully cross-channel experience for their customers? Cross-channel experience, in other words, across di different digital touch points. And we should consider here, these are digital touch points but there may well be some non-digital touch points too. So what are we seeing here? So 25%, uh, 58%, 50%, 10% from Banu. Hannah's giving us 20%. We're getting 30% uh, from Pia. Okay, sit tight. Here's the answer. What percentage of marketers use data to deliver a fully cross-channel experience? 1%. 1%. Now this may look alarming. This is from Google, this data, and you've got to believe they've got a huge amount of data to, to work with. And this reveals, I think, a massive opportunity. If businesses really want to get ahead with data and make sure that the data is captured and then presented in a, a, a fully um, uh, customized way across all those different digital touch points, the vast majority have got a long, long way to go. So with that, thank you for your engagement. Let me give you a, a, an independent perspective on this. Data is often seen as the most valuable resource. To those of you who read The Economist magazine, you will have seen this on the front cover of a fairly recent edition. And no surprises, we see the big um, digital innovators and pioneers, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Uber, Facebook, Tesla, all very much uh, uh, with their logos on the stacks. Uh, the stacks, of course, don't represent oil these days, but they represent data. So in some ways, you could argue that data is similar to oil. Taken from source, it's hard to work with. But once processed, it has multiple uses. And processing data is a really important part of the challenge. And we'll explore that in a little bit more detail later. However, unlike oil, which is a depleting resource, data is growing exponentially, not reducing, which presents an ever more uh, significant opportunity to master the art of data science and to drive competitive advantage. And as the availability of data increases, this becomes a greater priority as the months and years roll by. But just because you can access data, does that mean to say that you should be using it? Now, clearly there are some big permission issues. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, we were all receiving emails from brands we'd never heard of saying, um, we would like to uh, uh, remind you that you're opted into our service and provide for you some, some information or we'd like to use your data. And a lot of us would just unsubscribe immediately. I've got many examples of clients I've worked with whose subscriber bases dropped by probably 90% as people had to opt back in to receive consensual information and opt it out. So let's just be really clear here. Just because you've got a customer's data does not give you carte blanche to start using it. We really must respect customers' privacy. We must be adhering with GDPR regulations if you're part of the EU and similar regis legislative um, uh, policy will be introduced in other markets based on the GDPR principles, which are all about putting the customer first and insisting that the customer has visibility of what data or business has on it and the ability to opt out quickly and easily. So my watchword immediately, please, is get permission first. Don't assume you have the right to use customers' data unless your customers have indeed opted in. So if you're serious about data, you need a data strategy. And I would argue at a very high level, there are three key components to any data strategy. One, collecting data, looking at all of your assets and all of your campaign information. Number two, consolidating that data and bringing it together. Inevitably, there will be some 
differences of opinion, there may be conflicting data sets that we need to reconcile and we need to consolidate so we have a single version of the truth. And then the third bit, as revealed by some of my earlier questions, a massive opportunity is to extract the real value of this data and determining the full business impact. And I have to say now that while marketing is at the forefront of data and data uh, science, there are so many other aspects of your business that could usefully benefit from data and an application of the value of um, uh, applying data science to what you do. Let's look at these in turn. The first one was collect. So the key point here is not to just think of our customers as numbers on a database who fit some socio-demographic profile. This is very dangerous. It's very dangerous to make assumptions about customers based purely on their socio-demographic. A female, a parent, aged between 20 and 35, there are some huge differences. If that female is a, a student or a, a first jobber, if that person is a mother with a young family, their profile and their needs will be very, very different. And putting them in a demographic block like that will be very misleading. Much more important to move towards behavior and intent, really understanding what is it they're looking for, using their digital data. What are they searching for? Are they going abroad? Are they browsing? Are they using your app? What information can you capture digitally, which provides much more useful uh, signals of their actual behavior and their intent? Number two, consolidate the data. Well, there's a huge amount of data out there and we can track everything from the search terms they're using, the emails and mobile response rates, their site traffic, app sessions, registration data. And in theory, drop this into a single data warehouse, which gives us a single customer view. And then if we apply some business intelligence, we're able to do all sorts of very, very clever things and provide a much more uh, valuable experience to our customers. Sounds easy, right? Well, actually, there's a lot we need to think about here. To really extract the value of this data, we need to look at the different ways we can assess what we've got here, analyze, understand micro segmentation, not just some broad buckets of customers based on socio-demographic. Let's look at what multi-channel view of customer we can get by looking at all the different uh, behaviors we can track online. And then let's think about how we can find lookalike customers that match the profile of our existing customer base and fuse our primary data and third-party data. We then need to optimize. And of course, the age of digital is all about test and learn and optimize. What does that mean? It means optimizing our budgets using programmatic tools in order to place the most valuable combination of asset, creative, um, media uh, placement and track results, and then dynamically adjust what we're providing. We need to look at cost efficiency models to reduce as much as we can and automate the price and the cost of our media placement, which for many marketers is their biggest cost. Then we need to personalize. Think about all the opportunities to personalize, your web experience, life cycle communications to identify your highest life cycle customer and develop a personalized experience based on their value today and their future value and then look at event-based communications based on certain things you know is it their birthday their anniversary how long have they been with you so with this optimization allows us to develop some very different user experiences and i'm just going to break out now three areas where we believe data can significantly enhance your efficiency as a business and the marketing maturity that you are able to bring to the market and to, of course to your own organization and the first of these is personalization what do we mean by that well we mean don't treat all your customers the same and it should be really obvious to us now that if we've got three very different types of customer landing on our web page and they've got very different needs then we need to give them a very different experience you know you could have an organization i mean take amazon's the best example amazon seems to know more about the products and services i want before i realize it myself by looking at my profile identifying my existing browser and purchase uh, um, records 
and then making recommendations. So if I'm a, a young guy who's out there and I love um, a bit of a, a, a thrill seeker and I love a motorbike, for example, give me a motorbike offer. Likewise, if I'm a student and I'm wanting to get around, I don't have the budget for a motorbike, give me a bicycle offer. And if I've got young kids, talk to me about kids products. So at the most basic level, we can personalize the experience and all of us should be doing that by now. I'm gonna share with you now two other examples on personalization to show you what this really means. One of these is Vodafone. We've been doing some work with Vodafone recently, one of the many telcos we work with. And in this case, you can see how Vodafone is moving from a different experience dependent on how much they know about their customer. In the first screen you see on the left-hand side, for someone who has arrived for the first time, Vodafone knows nothing about them. So they can then be providing for them a whole list of different types of products and services they offer. When that customer returns for the second visit, the middle screen, we can show them the sorts of customized offers which we know they're interested in because we've already seen some browsing history. We maybe know something more about them from a registration form they filled in in the first instance. And then they, when they return the third time, we've identified them. We know who they are. We can welcome them back by name. Hello, Katie, power to mums. It's uh, that she's clearly done and showed some interest in some, some products which are linked to a different, a certain type of package or pro tariff that Vodafone offers. And this provides much more engagement and a much higher likelihood for Katie to build a loyal relationship with Vodafone and start spending more money with them and hopefully become a brand advocate. So that's personalization for a telco. Let's look at the retail sector. This is a fantastic example. Very.com, very.co.uk, the UK uh, based version of this business, they were about to go into chapter 11. They're about to go bankrupt. And they had to sell off their real estate and they were left only with an online business. They spent nine months analyzing their user base and built a thousand different personas for their customer base. And guess what? Each of those personas received a very personal experience because they matched the user with the relevant landing page. So we could have a message for a guy. Hello, summer style. This is for a male user. But if we know it's a female user, well, then we put a female based product there. And of course, a female person as the landing page. Each and every one of their pages has a shop now button. It's a very good user experience, very well designed. And guess what? If it's raining outside, well, then we can make sure that she's got a coat on or some winter apparel, or if it's a summer, then a summer uh, a clothing item. And also we can give her a welcome by name as we saw with Vodafone there. So we can see changing the, the face on the landing page, the product, and also some reference uh, to, to the mood. And yeah, I like a bit of humor here. Um, don't be caught out by the cold snap, keep warm, stylish, latest looks, blah, 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 shop now. And this has proven to be massively successful. After one year, they increased their sales by 20 million and doubled their, no, they quadrupled their click-through rate uh, onto conversion and their overall performance, conversion performance increased four times in the first year. Great example of personalization. If you're not doing this, you need to be asking why not? So the second thing, personalization one, the second thing is automation. What do we mean by automation? Well, everyone's talking about automation. Uh, at Google, there's a clear understanding that machine learning should be a core transformative way by which this business is rethinking how they do everything. The three and a half thousand products and services in development at Google right now are all driven with a machine learning component at the very core of the business case. No machine learning, no money. So machine learning is absolutely core. It's not just the big businesses though, all businesses should be thinking and bringing machine learning into what they're doing. Why should we be doing automation? Well, there are three basic points here. Number one, let's save money. Why are you spending a lot of time on repetitive jobs where you can be replacing manual optimization with retroactive analysis and then dynamically making decisions 
and having computers do the work that you don't need to do yourselves. Number two, let's be more effective. Let's think about how, if we're doing this properly and bringing in real-time data, we can replace a lag time with a real-time offer. You know, if I've been browsing on a website and I go and make a purchase, then why am I still receiving ads for the same product I've just bought? So we need to be much more real time to, uh, to, to match customers' expectations and improve the effectiveness. And then let's leverage. Marketing, as I said earlier, is at the vanguard here of um, digital and data, data science, but there are other parts of the business. Think about your operations, think about sales, think about HR. These are all areas where data and data-driven decision-making can radically transform the effectiveness the efficiency of what you're doing and of course save you money and allow you to redeploy resource to other areas that require human intelligence so what's driving this automation thing well there are three big drivers loads of data we've talked about that before loads of computing power all this stuff on the, in the cloud allows you to process vast amounts of data securely uh, in, in, in real time. And then the third thing is very smart tools, which allow us to, ex to, to analyze all this data and make smart decisions. So how does it work? Well, I want you to have a little look at this screen and tell me, can you tell me how many dogs you see on this screen? How many dogs do you see? Give me a number in the chat. Brian sees 10, Marla sees 10, Sanjana saying seven, we've got Manoj saying eight, Francois saying eight, uh, we've got, we've got uh, Krasimir saying 10. Okay, so no exact, no consensus here. And we've even got Rahana saying 16. Okay, so just have a little look at this. Now, this is a really good example of what machine learning is and how we can be using machines to do a lot of our um, automation. Now, there are two ways to uh, assess this, uh, this challenge, to work out the answer to my question. Uh, is this a dog or is this something else? This could be a muffin, which is the other thing that looks rather like a dog. We can either use programming. Now with programming, we can establish rules like a dog has two ears, two eyes and a tail. But you'll soon have a few problems. I mean, what if one of the ears is not visible? What if the eyes are covered by hair? Then you've got a problem. Is that a dog or is that something else? The other way to do it is machine learning. And with machine learning, you are providing labeled data and then asking the computer to find the right patterns. So if you're verifying the, 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 the model and the algorithm that suggests this is a dog and then overwriting the ones which are not indeed a dog and teaching the machine what is and what is not a dog, then the algorithm gets better and better and better and the machine gets smarter and can allow, uh, you can allow the machine to do more processing over time. So distinguishing between the dogs and the muffins might sound like a little bit of fun, but you can obviously see that machine learning, if it's programmed properly, can develop some very significant cost saving and efficiency uh, um, benefits for the business. Just think about how Facebook and Google, for example, and then think about the government in China using closed circuit TV footage can make massive decisions and, and uh, process vast amounts of data dynamically without the need for human intervention. So this is a really important area. The last point, I'm not gonna talk a lot about attribution because Sam's gonna talk about this further in a few moments, but let me just say two things. The first thing is that we should be looking to identify in a granular level exactly what we are doing and the impact that has on the behavior shift that we're looking to affect. So for most businesses, We've got websites which are now optimized for mobile. There will be many different functions on that web page. What we need to do is to identify what is the user flow, what role does the mobile phone have in the customer journey, and put a value against each of those actions. And we can see here that whether it's a store locator 
or subscribing to a newsletter or an FAQ or downloading some content, it's important to know which of these our customers are doing and then what impact that has on their relationship with us, how much money they're spending and their lifetime value. It's also important that we have a joined up approach. And I said earlier, only 1% of organizations, marketers say they're providing a truly cross-channel experience. Let me share an experience of mine. I'm wearing a pair of Levi's jeans today. When I bought my Levi's jeans, I did it because I got an email on my phone with a 50% offer. I then went into onto my laptop, went a little bit of time, checked out the jeans, saw some reviews, found my nearest Levi's store and went in there, picked off the pair of jeans off the shelf, went to the counter and then I wanted to pay for them. And the lady in the store said, thanks very much. That'll cost you hundred pounds. And I said to her, I'm not paying a hundred pounds. I'm gonna pay you 50 pounds. And she looked at me like I was crazy, disappeared with my phone, came back and very annoyed, or uh, grudgingly said, okay, 50, 50 pounds. Now, why was there a problem there? Just tell me in the chat, why was there a problem there? And what was the data issue that got in the way? What was the data challenge here? Multi-channel marketing wasn't well communicated, not updated for my profile. Sanjana, that's right. So she had a physical version of Rob who walked in the store, but there was no digital version of Rob. There was no connection. And this is a massive challenge. If I had had an app and I'd walked in with an app, if I'd had a voucher, we're gonna hear from an expert on Groupon in a minute, who knows all about this stuff. And there was a unique identifier for me and my digital profile, then I would have got my 50 quid jeans straight away. And she shouted after me when I walked out the door, do you want us to email you your receipt? Clever, because she can then link me to the purchase and that can be added to my customer profile. So there are many examples like this where businesses need to get a bit smarter. I would like now, I've been talking far too much, I'd like to hand over to Sam now, who's gonna to talk to us more about uh, attribution. So Sam, can I, oh yeah, just before I go, one last thing while you're doing that. It was World Statistics Day on Tuesday this week, World Statistics Day, and there was some fascinating um, um, stuff talked about. And one of the things I discovered was this book, Tim Harford, How to Make uh, the World Add Up. Excellent book, asking some really interesting questions about data and uh, data transformation. And the three big takeouts here, sense check the data that you're getting. Does it really feel right? And how does it make you feel? Consider the context. One data point in isolation is meaningless. How does that reference to what you did last week, last month, last year? How does it benchmark against your competitors? And finally, never give up being curious. We should always be curious and ask difficult questions in order to properly understand our customers and our business. And sorry, Sam, finally, if I can now hand over to you, please. Uh, Sam, I think you're on mute, but I can unmute you now. There we go. Hello. Ah, hi there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, loud and clear. Perfect. Um, I think I need you to stop sharing, Rob, so that I can start. Uh, okay, that's, okay, that's done now. Over to you. Okay, one second. Um, so, can people see uh, my screen now? Yep, that's that's up for me as well. Okay, perfect. Let me just get into full screen mode. And hopefully momentarily. Yeah, you're good. Yep, perfect. Okay, great. So, um, I think for anyone who just joined a little bit late, I'm, I'm Sam, the Chief Executive of uh, Bosper, and we're, we're a business that helps uh, our clients, uh, particularly in the direct-to-consumer space, independently measure their multi-channel marketing activities. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about why and how measurement and attribution are some of the biggest challenges that we see marketers uh, facing today. And, and from there, I'm going to sort of share a few practical tips that we think can make uh, a big difference quickly. And that's from our experience working with some fast growth online businesses. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to dive into enormous detail on various different attribution methodologies, including Foster's own, uh, but you know, would happily talk about that till the cows come home if anyone wants to get in touch uh, afterwards. <clears throat> so let's get let's get started. So uh, I'm going to start with a quote from Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report last year, which hopefully is popping up on people's screens. Um, 
I think it really captures the problem with measurement and attribution quite nicely. It, it still sounds crazy, though, saying this thing out loud. You know, sent, this quote says, the cost of acquiring customers can't carry on being greater than the customer's worth. It, it sounds mental, but it is, in fact, the reality for many, many online businesses these days. The question is, how can things be so out of control that marketers end up spending more to acquire a customer than they're going to get back in revenue from them? Well, I think I quite like the sort of visual example of, of uh, to, to describe how this problem occurs. And in this case, what a business wants to happen. So this is, this is hypothetical. And so the specifics will vary business by business, but the general themes will be similar. Um, this arrow along uh, the sort of the X axis is showing the customer over time, you know, the customer and their journey and their interactions with your brand. The blue bars are showing the sort of cumulative revenue you generate from that customer. The green bars are showing the cumulative marketing costs. So in this case, with the what should happen, this business may be prepared to make low margin or in fact, even lose a bit of money on the first purchase, where the marketing cost invested in converting the customer is greater than the value of the first order. But from this point, the business is backing itself to generate repeat purchases from the customer. That's where the blue bar rises up over time without incurring anywhere near the cost that they did on the first purchase. You know, they'd expect to retain that customer with, you know, a healthy sort of uh, email strategy to sort of make sure that they're not continuously paying to get that customer's attention. So on to the next slide, what happens when that goes wrong? Well, what happens is that the brand's unable to keep their acquisition cost under control. The budget that they'd intended to exclusively drive customer acquisition ends up inadvertently being spent on reacquiring customers through particularly digital channels where you can't control what people are clicking on as much. So that's why you know, that, that, that those green bars become bigger at the start and then the cost keeps, you know, the cumulative cost grows. And then also on the other side, uh, the brand doesn't get the repeat purchases and value that they'd forecast generating from that customer. So, you know, at the end of this sort of five to six purchase, you've got the cost of acquiring and reacquiring the customer being a lot greater than the value generated from that customer. And because all this happens over time, by the time the brand actually realizes this, it's already too late. They've lost the money. Uh, and that is kind of where the Mary Mika quote comes from and why so many brands uh, find that the cost of acquisition is outstripping the lifetime value. <clears throat> it might sound like kind of basic stuff to get wrong, but to understand why these things happen, uh, it's important to consider and critical to consider the, the impact of the complexity of the customer journey uh, has uh, today. You, you saw Rob's example before, the very nice nice version that he narrated where he described and, 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 and talked through the steps that he took with his Levi's, you know, what the brand actually sees and the reasons why they get it wrong is because of something like this. Um, this crazy web uh, is something we've actually sort of modeled for clients um, to show all of the kind of cross-channel interactions and dependencies in the customer journeys. You've got, you know, your clicks from, you know, somebody clicks on a Google link, an email link. You've got, you know, what people are seeing in Instagram and in Facebook uh, and many, many, many more. Uh, it was this, this, this sort of, you know, spider's web was never really supposed to see the light of day, um, let alone make it onto a, a webinar presentation. Should have, should have taken notes and done dogs and muffins. But uh, this, is, this is what happens when we do a data presentation. Uh, um, the, uh, the, what, the, what, what, the, what, the reason it's here today, actually, is because whilst it's probably the least actionable insight ever produced, the client loved how it showed just how difficult the marketer's job had become, how difficult it is to work out across the marketing mix what's really working, what's really contributing to acquiring customers and what's not. And if that wasn't difficult enough for them to uh, get their heads around, uh, it's complicated further by the fact that each of the different ad platforms that they will use uh, to try and acquire customers, you know, the Google, Facebook, et cetera, and, and, and much further beyond, they will typically claim 100% credit for conversions that they're only partially responsible for generating. So, you know, for, for, for example, uh, you know, Facebook uh, will will say you know, somebody saw an advert on Instagram, and then you know what the, the version of the customer journey they see is that someone saw something on Instagram, and then in the following days converted on the client's website. So they'll say we're responsible for that conversion. What this means for marketers is that the numbers that they see in the tools that they're using will typically give an inflated view of the return on investment 
It will give an artificially low number for the cost of acquiring a customer in their channel. And you know, we, we often hear that if they count all the conversions claimed by the different tools that they're using in all these different silos, they'll see between two to five times what actually happened on that day. You know, so two to five times as many customers uh, uh, converted. Um, so you can start to see how this complexity really affects a marketer's ability to keep the cost of their activities under control, why that uh, initial cost and then the subsequent costs would spiral. Um, I guess the final point to, uh, to mention on this before we sort of dive into what, what we can do to, to make a difference, uh, this is a quite an interesting uh, quote from a, a customer of ours that really summarizes things nicely when they said, at a channel level, the, how much it costs to acquire a customer is largely gut feel. So basically making decisions on when to spend their acquisition budget using the tools that uh, that are provided by the different ad platforms means that it's largely a sort of a gut feel on where, what to do next. And this, this lack of clarity in over-reporting makes it extremely difficult for these marketers to recognize when they're wasting money on saturated ch uh, channels and campaigns, as well as sniffing out growth opportunities and things to do differently in new and undervalued channels. And in summary, this is why marketers struggle so much with keeping their costs under control and why, therefore, getting a better grip on these things, getting a better grip on measurement and attribution is such a critical issue for them. So, uh, like with that as the sort of the lay of the land, yes, it's a difficult problem to solve. Um, there are a number of things that can make a big difference quickly. And here are, here are a few sort of practical tips that we've observed from the work that we've done with clients um, and, and things that we've really liked seeing where they've got it right. So the first tip is super simple. Um, but, but it's an incredibly effective way of getting started with an independent approach to attribution. Ask your customers um, what brought them to you. Um, sounds so basic, um, but the where did you hear about us uh, box at checkout, we find is so often overlooked or dismissed. Uh, but where we've seen some of the fastest growing businesses uh, succeeding, they've given themselves a lot of runway from a measurement perspective using this data. And you know, why not ask your customers where they heard about you? Clearly, it's not perfect. Some uh, people won't fill it in. Others will pick maybe only one channel when they actually became aware about your brand from multiple channels. Uh, some of them will pick the wrong stuff. But in general, brands who capture this data and use it to try and inform uh, what's working and where to put their next uh, advertising uh, pounds and dollars are in better shape than the ones who don't by the time that they need a more sophisticated approach. And in fact, even when they do need that more sophisticated approach, you know, and start thinking and adopting some of the some of the stuff that Rob was talking about earlier, some of the data science led um, approaches to attribution modeling like 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 we do at Phosphor. This where did you hear about us data remains a really powerful source of information to include in those models. You know, continue to listen to what your customers say and where they heard about you. So we always encourage brands, you know, even uh, it, it, as I said, it's not the answer to everything, but um, it can be an incredible source of sort of valuable intellectual property for a brand to know this information about their customers. On to the second tip then. So you, you, Rob showed the sort of the, the customer journey for, for his Levi's purchase earlier, and uh, that ties in nicely with, uh, with what we're showing here. So here you're seeing an example of what a business see if they deploy technology to track the customer journey on their site. With, uh, with changing data protection regulations like the GDPR, it's certainly true that less data is available uh, from, you know, from, from our platform, from Google, Facebook and beyond with data privacy to be able to join a perfect end-to-end -end view of your customer journey. You're highly unlikely to get a complete view of every interaction between your customer and a brand um, through this journey. Uh, data alone. However, the temptation that we've seen for marketers has therefore been to underplay the importance of having it at all um, and, you know, analyzing multi-touch customer journey data. Basically, the attitudes, if, I, if not every uh, marketing activity can be captured in the customer journey, it's not really worth um, capturing at all. And, and we think that, you know, whilst it's certainly true that it's not enough to only give credit to the things customers are clicking on, you know, then they click on that, you know, the, uh, Rob's example, the email he clicked on, the Google uh, search he clicked on. Uh, whilst you can't just give the credit to that, you know, versus what people are seeing in their social channels, what they're seeing, you know, on TV, there's still a huge amount that can be done with joined up first party customer journey data and lots of brands aren't doing it. Everything from understanding how channels drive not just immediate conversion, but longer term customer engagement 
um, you know, d understanding the role of things like email and how it interacts with your paid marketing activities. There's an awful lot of value that we've seen businesses derive from really diving into the details of the customers and the way that they uh, move through your uh, through your website and through the through your customer funnel. Um, and again, this, this journey becomes, you know, again, not the exclusive source of, of data for, for sort of more sophisticated measurement techniques, but an incredibly valuable source nevertheless. And we think that everybody really who's you know, marketing in more than two channels, you know, so it's quite straightforward to measure your uh, marketing performance when you're only doing something in one channel. But as soon as you do things in multiple channels, we think that businesses should be really challenging themselves to have a view on this um, and, and you know, move away from sort of aggregate metrics, like just how many visits did I get to really, you know, what were actual people doing over time, over channels, over pages, um, so um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully for people who don't feel like they have this in their organizations or their clients' organizations, they, uh, um, uh, they might think about ways in which they can get their hands on this um, uh, after this session. Uh, the, the third tip um, uh, is relates to the long, understanding the longer term value of your marketing activity. So at the start of the presentation, uh, we, uh, we I, I, I talked about that sort of not getting the repeat rate at the uh, at the at the rate that you'd expected the repeat purchase rate, um, and um, this this this, um, this sort of uh, this quote here from a client actually um, it, it relates to the fact that for them it was sort of critical to have a joined up view of the customer journey not just up to the point that they became the customer, but completely end to end, it's from not the first time that they purchased, the first time they interacted, all the way through um, multiple purchases um, and the full life cycle. What, why was this important? Well, because unless they really know the marketing activities that are driving long-term customer value, they don't really know how much they can spend on acquiring more customers. So brands like these continuously monitor the long-term value of customers relative to the marketing activities that drove the acquisition in the first place um, to ensure that their assumptions around how they can invest come true. When brands don't have an eye on this, uh, Rob talked a little bit about discount codes earlier, the cautionary tale there, that when brands don't have an eye on this, we often see them investing in channels and activities that appear to be giving them really good low-cost conversions but might not be giving them the best and most valuable customers in the long term. You know, we, we see that particularly with uh, affiliate partners and discount codes. You know, it, it can be an incredibly effective way to acquire customers. But you know, if you're not thinking about the, um, the, the type of customer you're creating, if you're um, you know, pr using increasingly aggressive discount codes to try and hit your uh, customer acquisition goals, then you may be creating customers who don't have the same affinity or loyalty to your brand as a customer acquired uh, in a different way. You know, these customers you know, who buy on a discount code may be unlikely to repeat purchase at the same rate. Maybe, maybe Rob after his uh, after his in-store experience with Levi's. So, so like, you know, that's not to say that these are bad or good. It's just that the, the brands that we see doing really, really well here, even if you know they're not able to give precise value in a very sophisticated way to the role that every single activity played in driving an acquisition, they will always loop back and say, you know, it, it could be a manual task initially and say, you know, what were the one or two marketing activities that we really think drove, drove this acquisition in the first place? And are our assumptions on how much they were worth over the second, third, fourth um, purchase over the six and 12 months, did they, uh, did they, did they play out? Um, so so on, on, on to the next topic, and actually speaking of manual tasks and, uh, uh, and, and brands uh, you know, doing some of this stuff themselves uh, in Excel. Um, yeah, I'll echo Rob's point about the the value of automation here, but specifically automation in the in the kind of the, the measurement and attribution context. So, uh, you know, one of the bits of uh, feedback that we hear is that you know embracing better measurement and attribution can feel like an enormous leap of faith, right? Like, it takes work to sort of bring all the stuff together. Um, you know, you don't really know what you're going to do differently with it. Like you, you, you're, you're sort of assuming that you're going to get better values and better uh, measurements. But, uh, you know, what, what's, the, what's the big sort of uh, decision you're going to take that's going to deliver the return on investment for the time that you've put in? Well, in quite, quite a lot of the conversations that we have with brands really are only when things go properly wrong, right? When the number, you know, that, 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 you know, the version I showed at the start where, you know, the costs is spiraling and the revenues are, are, are not, are not, are not following the same uh, trend line. 
Um, and you know, so, so they've got big problems and big, big, uh, um, you know, cold hard result investment they need to deliver. But actually, it's easy to overlook the efficiency wins from attribution. So the the amount of time businesses spend trying to make sense of that crazy spider's web I showed you at the start is enormous. Anyone who's had to put on this call, anyone who's had to pull together a summary of sort of cross-channel marketing performance for a quarterly board meeting will we'll know that this is the case. You know, uh, it can be huge, huge manual undertakings. And there is actually a, an awful lot of return on investment in simply having everything in one place, you know, a, a model that makes sure that everything adds up to 100% versus the, what I described earlier with you know, two to five times reality from the different siloed tools. And, and being able to see that in one place for the previous day, week, month, Saves an enormous amount of time. So we, we, you know, we we believe that um, businesses should be challenged. You know, the business case should be, you know, better decisions with my paid media budgets and sort of significant return on investment from 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 becoming more sophisticated in the approach to to attribution. But actually, the the time saving and the efficiency gain, um, you know, is valued by some of the fastest growth businesses that we've seen um, adopting these kind of techniques. In fact, one of the larger ones ended up saving about 500 days of analyst time a year um, through through um, adopting a data-driven um, approach to attribution. And the, the question that they asked their team member was, what would you do if you had 500 days back that wasn't spent manually wrangling this data? Um, so automation, I, 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 a hearty second of, the, uh, of, of Rob's point on the value of automation here. Um, and, and then to finish, something that will maybe sound a little bit fluffier than the, 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 than the previous points, but in our experience, it's kind of the most important tip or thing to bear in mind on the topic of attribution, and that's adopting the right data-driven mindset. So the best brands that we see um, it, it, from a mindset perspective recognize first and foremost that um, uh, attribution is wrong. <laughs> and that's like, I mean, just done 15 to 20 minutes on this, um, you know, all attribution models are wrong. Some are, some are less wrong than others, um, but they use better attribution and better measurement to enable better, but, but still imperfect decisions quickly. They look for signals that support their hypotheses and react quickly with a sort of real desire to do things differently. And, and when brands get their approach to attribution wrong, they tend to spend time obsessing about how much better one model is than the other, or how perfect the value is that's attributed to a keyword or an ad, and miss the really, really big picture. In the hypothetical example that I've, uh, I've included here, you know, the, the blue bars represent the uh, you know the customer acquisition cost that um, the business was uh, reporting before in the in, in the different ad platforms they thought it cost cost X in Snapchat and Y in TikTok to acquire a customer and then when they adopted the data driven approach um, they saw a different view where as I mentioned earlier you know it, it tends to be a little bit more expensive when the credits shared out amongst everything that's played a role but you know the the best brands would look at something like this. And they would see really strong signals that, you know, for example, and this is totally hypothetical, you know, it's costing a lot more in Facebook than I thought it was. It's costing a lot more in affiliates when, you know, affiliates were getting a great amount of credit, but, um, but taking it from stuff that was playing a role earlier in the customer journey. Pinterest, on the other hand, there's a strong signal that the cost of acquisition in Pinterest is a lot lower than we thought it was. So when we see like, you know, brands uh, using this stuff in the right way, they're recognizing a better system and measure and they're looking for these strong signals that you know, oftentimes support a, a, really, um, a, a really sort of strong hypothesis they already had around where they were spending too much or too little. And then you know, they'll probably go and take this data and they'll run some tests. So maybe they'll go and ramp a, a controlled experiment in Pinterest. Maybe they'll, uh, they'll look at some of the worst performing ads or campaigns in, the, in Facebook and affiliates, and they'll go and do something differently and then they'll measure the results on the other side. When brands get it wrong, they question the precision. Uh, you know, they, they'll say, is this perfect? Is it right? It, you know, is it £45 to acquire a customer in Facebook or 46 um, and, and miss the big picture. So the reason I think this is such an important one to finish with is because everything else I've shared today, uh, it's kind of, you know, all of the other approaches to attribution are irrelevant if they're not coupled with the right mindsets and this sort of um, this recognition that, um, you know, all attribution modeling is wrong. Some's less wrong than others. And the goal is to make, get better data, have an awareness of the data that you have and start using it to make better decisions. 
So then the final slide, just to summarize that before passing back over to Rob. Um, so just, just playing back the, the tips that um, the tips that I ran through. There is data it, it, almost certainly uh, available to you or you know easily available to you if you choose um, if you choose to capture it that, that in, in the customer journey, um, in what customers will are prepared to tell you about where they heard from you. And this 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 can go a hell of a long way. To improving the, the way that you measure the effectiveness of your marketing and marketing activities, um, and is you know, consistently underestimated by many brands um, that we that we talk with. Um, the second thing is that you know, businesses they need to know not just how their marketing activities drive acquisition performance, but long long term performance. You know, yeah, everybody will have their targets and there will be short term targets, but somebody in the organisation needs to be thinking about the long term. Uh, and and how the, the the decisions that they take today and tomorrow drive um, uh, behavior and revenue in 12 to 18 months. Then, as I as I as I said earlier, you know your marketing measurement um, needs to needs to deliver return on investment. You need to be able to measure the cold hard return on investment, um, but don't underestimate actually how much of that can be gained from automation and you know the, the challenging yourself with the, with the time you would get back on what you would do with it the um the uh the the ability to sort of turn on a sixpence and go and uh, take decisions um, more quickly um uh so automation uh um, is key and then finally just to just to hammer it home everything's wrong all models are wrong anything that deploys machine learning will be a version of wrong but some are a hell of a lot better than others so use the signals to guide better decisions wherever they are and and don't get lost in the details. That's my that's my, my my summary of uh, of the problem. And hopefully, a few a few quick things you can do um, that will make real meaningful impact quickly. Uh, so thanks very much, and back over to you, Rob. Um, that's that's awesome, Sam. Thanks so much. I've been writing so many notes here with those tips, and uh, I, I just would call out before we take any questions. This this your last of those tips. So be guided by the data, not imprisoned by it. And I, and I think this is. This is very consistent with a theme that we've been developing. I'm, I'm just about to uh, finish a, a book and there's a whole con section there about data. And we kind of uh, like to use the analogy that data and data analysis should be the headlights that direct where you were driving and not the rear view mirror to tell you where you've come from. And I think for so many years, marketers have used data to explain what they've done in the past rather than to direct where they're going in the future. And so I think there's some really valuable tips there. And Sam, thanks so much for sharing those, those with us. Now, we've got some questions uh, in the chat, which we've been, uh, we've been um, uh, picking up as we go through. And I'd just like to jump on a couple of those, if I may. So we had a question first up from Sally. Sally was referencing the book I showed earlier and saying, is that for beginners to read? or is that more sophisticated? And I would say, Sally, it's very much uh, written in layman's language. The, Tim, the author, um, is a, a, an Oxford grad who's worked with a, a very, very impressive array of government um, think tanks and independently as a consultant, but it is very easy to read. And I, would, uh, I wouldn't be in any doubt about uh, how easily you could get to grips with the principles quickly and easily. So I would suggest that's well worth the read if I were you. Um, the second question I see is from Carmen, um, who was saying, well, we've seen a lot of B2C, but what about B2B? Have you got any B2B examples? And I think Carmen, the answer is yes. And in many ways, the B2B examples are so much more impressive because by getting this right and understanding better the B2B relationship, the lifetime value of a B2B relationship is likely to be significantly greater than B2C. And the duration uh, of the amount of time it takes to, to land those, those contracts and those relationships is significantly longer too. And there are many examples. Now, I would point to two main areas and very happy to share uh, more info on this, financial services. Um, you can see that with some of the fintech organizations, they've been very good at understanding their B2B customer base and using that in order to unlock new revenue streams, build new platform partnerships and extract more value uh, as a result. 
think about, for example, Starling and Monzo, the, the, the UK based fintech businesses, look at what Ant Group in China has, has done. This is the highest ever IPO valuation went through um, earlier this month. And if you look at the way that that business has grown, it's all based on real time data capture from their various uh, platform partners and using that to create new markets and new partnerships where it's the customer data, B2B customer data, that has affected their whole product roadmap and the substantial revenue growth and, and enterprise valuation they built on the back of it. You could then look at some of the other businesses and I think about businesses like Grab uh, and GoCheck, the, uh, these, these, well, they're, they're kind of um, uh, online taxi companies but they're way more than that. They're delivering food, they're delivering services, and there's a B2B world which has evolved very, very quickly around a, a data-driven uh, business principle, which can be monetized in many ways by all platform par partners. So happy to share more info, Carmen. If that's valuable, please do get in contact. Um, any more questions here? Well, so actually, I Rob, Rob I, I, I just pitch in actually from the attribution perspective as yeah, well with, um, uh, regarding Carmen's question about B2B. I mean, everything I, I describe really in the presentation is relevant to, to B2B as well as B2C. I think the only, the, the, the only change um, is the role of uh, the requirement for machine learning. So, you know, when, you, when you're talking about a B2C business that will have, you know, um, a, a huge number of interactions, um, uh, you know, massive amounts of traffic, uh, massive amounts of impression data from the different ad platforms, uh, you know, and, and a closed loop acquisition funnel so that like people buy online, then, you know, the requirement to have a machine to interpret the uh, and value every activity along the way is greater. It's simply you know, too, too difficult for people to do alone. However, with, with B2B businesses, but firstly, you know, we work with B2B businesses who are at a scale, a larger scale than, uh, uh, than some B2C businesses. Um, but, but actually the requirement, the things asking the same questions, while well, I might not need, um, you know, as, as uh, sophisticated a, a machine learning approach, you know, things like asking a customer where they heard about it, things like tracking the customer journey become even more critical because of the size of the prize. So, yeah, you, you know, it may be even that you, you, you are selling stuff at such a, uh, a high price that you, you can afford to go in and look at the single user level journey and, and understand everything about what drove that customer to purchase. Um, so certainly believe that, um, that, that the questions there are, are the same ones. So, so too is the, the last point around, about acting on signals because you typically won't have um, the data volumes of a B2C business. Um, you, know, you may not get statistical significance in every single um, uh, finding and every single bit of analysis. So acting on signals and being prepared to sort of jump on, uh, on, on things that look like they're working better, things that look like they're uh, working worse, um, it, it is even more important um, uh, in, in that context. So, yeah, ho hopefully, I think all, all that stuff can be applied um, uh, very, very nicely to B2B and happy to chat um, uh, and, and discuss in more detail if it makes sense to you. That's great. And I see, thank you for that uh, build, um, Sam. And one, one more question we've got here from Leroy talking about getting data from the platform providers, you talk about Shopee and Lazada. Now this is a fascinating area. And if we look at the whole area of e-commerce and the platform providers, um, how much intelligence can you get back? Well, we're working right now on a program with our, with our partners, uh, Avado right here for um, Colgate. And the, the, the program we're delivering to the Colgate team focuses on all aspects of data science and that feeds into the e-commerce model and what we're seeing is that for a business like Colgate if they can extract um, performance data from Lazada and Shopee and some of their e-commerce partners they're able to radically improve the the way that these these products are delivered on the platform the pricing propositions the delivery configurations, uh, if, if a, a delivery um, uh, part of the, the value chain is, is added in, and they're getting a vast amount of information back from these partners because they've got a genuine uh, joint business plan, and it's in the interests of Shopee and Lazada to ensure that Colgate maximizes their sales 
and they're assisting them leverage the platform as effectively as they can. Of course, this is all about attribution. This is all about data-driven decision-making. So again, Leroy, please feel free to get in contact if you want more information and um, the Avado team myself will be happy to share some of the methodology with you there. Um, so I'm wondering, do we have any more questions? I'm aware we don't have many more seconds to go because we're kind of on the hour and out of time. Um, please feel free, if there are any more questions to pop them in the chat now. And if we don't have any more questions, um, can I ask, can I ask Sam, if you can just jump on a couple of slides, because I think you're still in control of the deck. Um, and we can, we can wrap up with, yes, I, I, I think there's a, a, a slide towards the end uh, about the program that we've now come to yeah. the end of. And what I would just leave you with is one very simple message. If you've enjoyed today's session, and we hope you have, and the feedback's been very positive here, and you want to have a go at applying this to your own business, um, then just, uh, just as for the data-driven marketing lab tester, we're running a session next Thursday, the 22nd, at one o'clock. I will be hosting it. And I'll be very happy to elaborate on some of these points uh, in that event. So please feel free to sign up. And we look forward to seeing, seeing some of you on that call, hopefully most of you on that call. And we will go into far more detail and explain how this uh, taster lab um, can, can solve some of these challenges. Uh, and we can make this very applicable to your business by having some activities linked to your own business challenges. So please join us for that taster next Thursday. Um, this is the last webinar in the series, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us over the last eight weeks. I hope you found this valuable, and we really look forward to staying in contact with you uh, beyond the end of this, this session. So with that, a massive thank you from me um, and from the Avado team, I'm sure from Sam also. A few closing words, Sam. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. I enjoyed the session today, and great. So thank you very much for taking the time, uh, and uh, look forward to hopefully I'll go with some of you soon. Awesome. Thanks for that, Sam. Thanks all once again. And thanks, of course, to Avado for setting all of this up. So all the very best. Keep safe and best of luck with your data-driven uh, marketing maturity. Thank you for now.